Hello and welcome back to Where Are All My Friends. This episode is with a rather accomplished man, and that is Jim Rhoda. And he's had a very successful career in both music and film and production. And it was a really interesting, cool thing to hear about. His band, Fireball Ministry, got signed back in 1999, and they toured way before GPS and social media. So hearing him explain what it was like to get signed then and how he got signed was awesome. And then he's had this super successful successful career in film and production and worked on major motion pictures and been a part of some really cool things there. Worked with Dave Grohl and Therapy Studios on Sonic Highway and Sound City and a bunch of other stuff and now works with Blackmagic Design and we had this really cool conversation about like what Blackmagic is doing to support the future of all creativity and kind of his view on that. So overall, a dude that has never stopped doing awesome shit, and I love the way he put all of it. So let's get right into it. Enjoy. Where are all my friends? Jim Rhoda. And as I'm about to introduce you, I'm sitting here and I'm like, dang, you have a lot of, a lot of things here tied to you. The band, <laughs> Fireball Ministry, Therapy Studios, Blackmagic Design. There's a lot of stuff you do. And I barely know the beginning of it. And I think that this is going to be a really fun story to hear. It's, you know, it's the curse of never, you know, not wanting to be busy, you know, always wanting to be doing something. This yeah. Is, you know, it's just severe ADD, I think. I don't, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's but funny. Anyways. No, it's funny you say that because that's uh, honestly a common theme in the podcast is creatives get so excited and they're so, they, you got to be figuring things out. And there's always so many more things to them. Like, I just do this. It's like, no, then this and this and this. So right. I feel well, everything that always ends level. up coming together. And, and you know, I, I think that, I think that's like that with most people's paths, you know, the, you know, I, I feel like people who have like the most, you know, that seem to be the most satisfied with their life paths aren't the people that stayed doing one thing in particular for too long. Like I, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, like that's not a, you know, it's not a great life to go work with the same company for 30 years or 40 years and then retire because you've put so much money away. But the people that I meet that have actually put some thought into becoming something that's not the same as, or not, doesn't follow the same path. Those are the, those are the people that seem to be the most satisfied as far as I know. And I would probably say that everybody listening or watching this podcast feels the same way. So let's just go ahead and we'll agree with that. Cool. There. cool. <laughs> but, All right, um, we're off to a good start. I would say so. I would say so. <laughs> but yeah, dude, I, I think like I'm so excited for this one specifically because you've been in the game longer than I have. And you, you like the band Fireball Ministry was that your start? Because that's been a band well, for a I'll minute, tell you, and I'm so you curious know, what that was like. Well, I'll tell you, my you know, I made a deal with my dad because I wasn't a great student in high school, but I made a deal with my dad that I would go to college. He was one of the only people in his family to go ever go to college, so uh, you know it was like a thing for him. He had you know immigrant parents, and you know like those kinds of things. My family's Italian, so it was a bigger deal you know, for him than it was for me, but I made it that deal with him. And I went to school and at the university of Cincinnati and I had already kind of been following the trends of how uh, post-production and production were happening. But also I had this, you know, like this life obsession with music. So I knew one day I would, you know, we would start a touring band and I would do all that stuff. But I guess it was like that classic, you need something to fall back on, kid. You know, that that line. I knew that all this stuff was moving toward computers. Yeah. You know, like I had already been interested enough in the technology side of everything to say like, okay, well, this is going to be a thing. I learned how to use a DDR10, which was this thing that a company named Atari invented that was, uh, <laughs> it ran Sound Designer 2, which was the predecessor to Pro Tools. Wow. It was a destructive two track editing software program that went up to 48K. And that was a big deal. And then I learned how to cut on an Avid. I got a job on a TV show called Pop-Up Video. And okay. I actually, remember that show? Yeah, it was MTV or VH1. It was where they, it was like yeah, the facts VH1. behind the yeah, music yeah. videos. Yeah. So I got a job on that show via a friend of mine from 
grade school. And I remember I went to the guys that were running, you know, that created the show. And I said to them like, Hey, look, I learned on this thing called an avid in high school and college. Like we should be doing your show in avid here at the 1515 building in Times Square where the show was. I would always come up with these ideas on how to do stuff with the show production and post-production wise. And the guys would shoot them all down. And I'm the kind of person that I can take a hint, you know, Uh like when if I've if I've been at the party too long, I'm all I'm all good. I'll I'll jet. I said, fuck it. I'm gonna go move to LA and put a band together and I'm gonna be in a band now. So I had you know, I fulfilled my duty to my dad to get a college degree, all yeah. good. I tried it out working on a TV show. And you know what? I just wanted to play music and hang out with my friends. So Emily from you know, from Fireball Ministry and I moved out to LA together and Basically, we started looking for people to be in this band. We had an idea of what the band would be, the kind of music it would be. You know, we came up with this name based on uh, because I had met her in college in Cincinnati. So we came up with this name based on a public access show that was all on in Cincinnati. And, you know, we came out here and put together a band and. You know, somebody thought we were, you know, good enough to give us a record deal. So the way we got our record deal, yes, was I. We had recorded like four or five songs back in New York. And then we were like, okay, this is the band. But Emily and I played all the instruments and I sang. We got to LA with this, basically a demo tape. Every week I would send out a demo tape to all five of the labels that we wanted to be on. None of them were majors because, you know, fucking no one's going to sign us. (laughs) <laughs> on a major because at the time you know like it was like stoner rock or whatever and that wasn't like a viable oh, thing like it yeah. became a thing later you know like i guess now or whatever but uh long story short i would only stop sending a tape if you told me to stop sending a tape that was how i did it and then i started going and finding things to put in the the cases with like the bag the mailers with the tape i would drive down to tijuana and i would buy these packages like this big of mexican uh wrestling figures they were like hard plastic molded i forget what you call oh i remember those like just like those like crappy toys like it was just like a yeah, they had, like, hard the plastic yeah yeah little guys so i would throw I, like one week i would throw one of those in each of the of the mailers and then the next week i'd find some other thing and throw them in the mailer and eventually like you know i would either get a call back that said please stop sending us your tape or we'd take a meeting and and one of the labels that called us back for a meeting was uh was the label bong load that had put out uh the mellow gold album for beck had put out a couple of fu manchu the band fu manchu records and we really thought that label would be cool for us and that's basically how we got a record deal by annoying people dude i love that as well because again like you hear this talked about like you hear Mm -hmm. bands having to get creative to this day and obviously you're not mailing demo tapes but like there's just something to this that i'm hearing of like you having this different view on things the ultimate motivation for me is when i feel like somebody's telling me i can't do it you can do anything it's just you have to be willing, in my opinion, to accept that it's not going to go exactly the way you thought it would. You just have to be willing to not think that it's going to go a certain way, but you can still have all that great experience and be a part of all these amazing things. You know, it just not might go how you think it's going to go. Here's where I'm just like, tell me everything. Okay. Getting signed, touring yes. Los Angeles, yes. 1998. That's yes. I, I did not have the concept of music and touring at that time. Like, yeah, I heard music on the radio as a kid. I like paint me that picture. Like, are you still in Ford vans? Like, were you doing a bus? Oh, yeah, yeah. Doing... I mean, like, we don't really ever not do a van. OK, unless we're in Europe. Yep. Yep. OK, like here we'll do like now it's like a sprinter. It's a sure. lot nicer. But yeah, I mean, that, that those early days, we had a 1970 seven uh chevy suburban with a u-haul trailer that was our thing oh we would schedule like press and interview stuff at truck stops that we knew we could make it to yes and do the phone call do the phoners on the payphones oh my god so you'd be like all right we have a pilot coming up in 50 miles we'll be there in an hour or so 
Yeah. We'll sit down and we'll cell eat phone. lunch. Well, cell phone. No, no cell phones. No. I mean, we, it, we had one, but it was like, you know, it was like emergencies. It was like an Ericsson brick thing that was right. like six feet long. <laughs> Not, I mean, six feet thick. My early days of touring would have been 2008. But we okay. had like MySpace and YouTube enough to be like, yeah. oh, once we get to Texas, we're going to have good shows. Like we could see, yeah. enough, like we could see people RSVPing online and stuff like that. Would you, would promoters like call you with presale ticket counts? Like, would you have any idea or like, were you just like rolling the uh, dice, I showing mean, up, hoping people were there? Yeah, like when you're, when you're, when you were a band, at, like, it, it, you know, like in the eighties and nineties, you were at the mercy of all those people. Yeah. In my experience, it was very rare to find a promoter that knew how to get kids to come to shows or people to come to shows. Like later on in our band's career, we did a lot of touring with like established acts. So that yeah. stuff didn't apply anymore. It didn't apply then, but you know, if you want to hear a funny story, I was working on a, one of the Narnia movies, but uh, Eddie Izzard was doing the voice of somebody. It was cheaper for them to fly to Canada to do the VO than to get a place in LA to do it. So uh -huh. we took a private jet up to Vancouver and then we flew back down. On the way back down, I started asking him, I was like, hey, you know, we're on this plane. It's a, you know, it's like a little plane. So we're all just sitting on top of each other. And I'm like, hey, I was like, do you like doing, you know, movies or do you like, you know, touring and doing your stand up stuff and your shows more? And he was like, the shows. He's like, the shows I can handle. And he's like, I can handle all of it. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, for example, when the promoter says that they're going to promote the show, that they were going to do local and local promotion for the shows, he was like, don't spend any money on that. I'll do it myself. He goes, this is what we're going to do. I'll promote the shows in every city. And he goes, that way I know how many people will be there. And then that way I'll know he was doing analytics is my point, like before internet, before anything, he just took all that, all of that promotion and stuff into his own hands with his own team. So he would know I'm playing here tonight and I know that I should make this much money because this is the amount of people that are going to show up because I have my own set of analytics that can say, you know, this is, and then he, he would base his tours on that, all those analytics and those yeah. metrics, like, Hey, and that's all pre-internet everything. That's so sick. That's so cool. Know, because that's yeah, it's like touring now, <laughs> you have so much more data. And like, but I just like, I love those stories of early tour. Like that's fucking rock and roll to me. Is like, you're just getting in a van, showing up. Yeah, you know, there were plenty of shows, especially early on where it was like 10 people. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the reason that you get back and do it all over again is because the next time those 10 people each brought two friends. Yeah. And then the next time those four people, you know, whatever, yeah. and you know, it goes exponentially like that. And, and then like, what are some of the highlights? Like when you were supporting artists, like you had toured with some pretty cool artists, right? You know, because we toured with Motorhead, Lemmy became a friend. And yeah. because we toured with, you know, we toured with Dio, you know, Dio, I wouldn't say he was a friend, but like I could pick up the phone and call Ronnie James Dio. And if you would have told my 15 year old self that I would have been like, you're a crazy person. Like that yeah. was ever going to happen. Yeah. But, you know, we've gotten to tour with like a lot of our, you know, heroes and a lot of our idols and, and people that we re respect musically. And yeah, I mean, it's just a lot of luck. It's, that's all this is. Like, trust me, there's no... There's no plan. Yeah. He's not one that you can put in motion. No, totally. It's just, I don't know. It's just cool. I, I like hearing about that. It's a, it's a different era and I respect it a lot. So that's a, a lot cool of fun. One. So that's the band and did quite a lot with it. But then there is this other side of you that was, that had a very strong knowledge of film production and you were doing these very big things. So at what point, like you went from pop-up video to then being like, cool, LA band. I, I had personally, I had about eight years where the band was my income, right? Okay. Yeah. And then after that, I, you know, Napster happened in like 2005. Oh, shit. I hope this isn't taken as being bitter, but like it changed everything for bands our size. You know, you couldn't rely on the same things as you could before to make money. If, if a musician can't, you know, make money selling their music, then what the hell are they going to do? I saw the writing on the wall and I got this opportunity from this guy that I had met through a friend of mine to work on the first Narnia movie. And they basically just needed help, you know, managing and wrangling all this data that they were like, they were starting to, 
you know, a crew. I kept moving on to different other movies and other movies and other movies. And, you know, people saw that I had the skill set. So then I just, you know, I just kept getting hired on, on movie crews until the specifically doing what just workflow, you know, like putting together workflows for, I mean, it didn't really, I didn't really be, you know, come into my career until the third Narnia. And the third Narnia was special because they were shooting it digital. Oh. No film. No one had done a full end-to-end digital movie before the third Narnia movie. Wow. And that in itself posed a lot of challenges. Because again, you know, okay, so we're going to shoot, we're going to plug this camera into this box that was called a codex, which still exists to this day, much different than the first iteration. We're going to plug this camera into this box. It's going to make a bunch of files. And then we have to take all those files and put it in Avid so we can cut it. But we we haven't really figured out how to make those files into Avid files yet. There hasn't, transcoding hasn't really been invented for filmmaking you know, like changing one file into another file because, you know, Avid needs specific types of files to edit and go in there. Yeah. So none of that stuff had ever really been done before. And, you know, I, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't all me. It was people a lot smarter than me, you know, coming up with all of those concepts, you know, like the concept of a, of a DIT or a dam on set that wrangles all the data from the camera that had never been done before that movie. I mean, that was the, I say all the time when people talk about their onset workflow and their post workflow, I'm like, yeah, you, you, you're still doing all the same mistakes and bad practices that were done on the third Narnia movie. So <laughs> Dude, how the fuck did you know this? If you were coming from like singing in a band and writing music, like know, how are I, you yeah. showing up to Narnia and being like, yeah, file management, digital files and Dude, codex. Well, this like, is, what? This is, I hate to not be busy. You know, it's in my DNA to need that. And I need to be moving forward and creating something and solving some kind of issue. I'm like, I'm like, I'm genuinely trying to understand though. Like, was it a skill set that you had developed in school and coming from no, like the, the top of the video day? <laughs> So I like, don't, I don't, you know, honestly, I've never been asked this question, so I don't <laughs> know how to answer it. Like I, <laughs> you know, I've just been able to put all of my interests into into a spot where they can all be satisfied without having to compromise all that much. And that's the magic, right? Like the compromise is what'll kill you. Like if you know you want to do something or you know you can do something, then just do it. Cause yeah. if you you know the minute you compromise and get comfortable, you're fucked. Like it's it's over. The game's over. Like you just you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable, in my opinion. Like that's the only way that you'll, you know, get to wherever wherever it is you're trying to go. And and to be honest, not everybody's like that. You know, not everybody wants to produce movies and play in a band and you know be you know like play pretend for a living like I get to. Yeah. Not everybody wants that life. But in my in my experience, there's no better way to get that life than you know to be comfortable being uncomfortable. No, I, I love that. I love that. So you got into movie production and it was a it was an uncomfortable but stimulating fun challenge. I didn't know what yourself. the fuck I was doing. Like I got hired by this amazing human being named Jonas Thaler. He's a you know, he was an assistant VFX editor on um, Empire Strikes Back. He was one of the editors on Amadeus cut Friday the 13th, part six, Jason lives. You know, he was a post. He was the post supervisor on all the Peter Jackson uh, Lord of the Rings movies. Hmm. And this guy, for some reason, saw something in me and gave me this gig because he was like, well, it seems like you can handle. Jonas is actually the guy that every time some new technology came along for filmmaking, he was the first one to be like, we got to try that. Hmm. We got to try that. Hmm. And in that spirit, you know, that was that was a great garden for me to be planted in, because with that attitude, I'm the best like. If you just give me the resources, I'll give you results. Like I promise. I That's you know, sick. I don't I don't, you know, I don't like to bullshit people as many many people will test. Actually, don't know if I explained this in the beginning. Maybe I'll do it in the intro, but the reason that we're talking right now is because of Joe DeSanto, who yes. I met uh 
through a crazy, crazy Google search and learning LLC stuff. But he had been a part of Therapy Studios, John Ramsey there. This is an interesting tie because here you are now with a very, very full understanding of music, having very much done it yourself, and then a great understanding of film. And somewhere in this picture, and I don't exactly know where, Sound City and Sonic Highways happens with Dave Grohl, Foo Fighters. And I feel like that's got to be a crazy, like, that had to have been a fun, fulfilling project. And you were a part of that, right? To a pretty, no? I had known Dave since about 2000 or 2001. I was introduced to him. There was a guy, a record producer and a very close friend of mine and Dave's named Nick Raskulinix, who had done two records with us up to that point. And he had done two Foo Fighters records up to that point. And, and, you know, Nick thought that Dave and I would get along because of our kind of mutual love for music. And I like, we, we, you know, we share a passion for it. So Nick was like, ah, you guys, you have to hang out, this, that, and the other thing. So it was like, all right, great. So that's how I got introduced to Dave. You know, cut to 2013, he gets a call from, well, the band had made a documentary about the band called Back and Forth. Okay. And then 2013 rolls around and Dave gets a call from uh, that the woman out at Sound Studio, the daughter of Tom Skeeter, the owner, her name's Sandy. And Sandy says, hey, you know, we're selling the A console because somebody doesn't want it. And Nevermind had been recorded on that. And so it meant a lot to Dave. And so he bought it. And then I remember when we were there, because we shot time lapse of us, you know, of everybody moving it out of the of South City. Because Dave was like, we should film this. And we were there. And Tom Skeeter, the owner of the studio, comes in with this, this stack of like paper that's like this thick. I don't know if you could see that, but it's like yeah, it was like yeah. half a, half an inch, almost an inch thick. And he goes, This is a running archive of all the albums that have ever been recorded here. And we were like flipping, Dave and I were flipping through the pages and just going like, holy shit, holy shit, oh my God, that too, this, that, you know, we were doing that. So we get out into the parking lot and the, and the van, you know, the console's loaded into the U-Haul because that's how, you know, you move a giant, you know, console that changed everyone's life. (laughs) Um, I mean, I don't know what else I would do. A U-Haul seems good. At least you didn't use a pickup truck. Right. I guess. So anyways. We get out in the parking lot. They move the console into the U-Haul. And Dave goes, we should interview a bunch of people that recorded here for like a web thing. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that'll be fun. Like, yeah, we'll get Tom. We'll interview. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah, call your buddy Tom Petty. And then we'll, you know, and at this point, Dave and I had never really worked together. We were just, you know, homies. And I remember I talked to him like three days later. And he was like, I want to make a movie. And the first thing out of my mouth was, you don't want to make, you don't want to make a movie. <laughs> no, you don't. Honestly. Dave. No, you don't. Yeah. I was like, you don't want to do that. And he's like, why? And I'm like, it's really hard and it costs a lot and it takes a lot of time. And, uh, and he was like, well, I want to make a movie about Sound City. And he like basically wrote out a whole outline of the whole movie. I don't know if you, you've seen it, but he wrote out the whole thing. So then I'm like, well, if you really want to make a movie, we need to call John Ramsey. Cool. Because John, because John Ramsey's the only person that's going to be able to make a movie that you want to make, and he and I can do that together. And I mean, that is how it all started. Like it was that simple. Like let's all make a movie about something fun, and then we did. And then we made the movie, and people liked it, and you know, it came out and whatever. And then again, he just had this idea: we should drive around the the country, and we should, you know the band should record a song in all these cities and we should talk about, you know, like that's how it happens. He just has these ideas. And at this point, you know, John and I are just like facilitating it for him, you know, for every, for all of us, you know, and it's fun. He's got, Dave has this, you know, obviously this, he's, you know, this very dedicated group of people that like, you know, take care of all his endeavors and, you know, between them and us, you know, I think we really turn out some awesome content, <laughs> uh, if you will, which, you know, drives me nuts. Don't get too uh, excited just, about that word now. Well, it just, you know, it, that's what's inside of a milk container. You know what I mean? Like content is what's inside of, a you know, like a food package. It's not <laughs> yeah. fucking shit you have to like kill yourself to make, you know? Yeah. that's I've never Anyways. heard anybody said it like that. And I really actually like that. It's so 
dismissive of like people's hard work to me. I mean, you know, look, I'm fucking almost 50. I'm, you know, I'm a dad. I, I'm going to complain about everything. <laughs> uh, but that always drives me crazy. But anyway, no, totally. long, story yeah. Sh- yeah. long story short, we love making stuff together and we will, you know, until, you know, somebody doesn't want us to make stuff anymore. Like <laughs> Dave and John and I have a, you know, I like to think it's a pretty awesome relationship and we, we end up making all this cool stuff that like matters a lot to all of us, each of us. So yeah. Yeah. Well, that actually, that ties me to my, my next question is just like, tell me about your life right now. So you've had this success and gotten signed and toured and had lived that life. You've had a crazy amount of success in the film production world and you've been a part of major motion pictures and really cool movies and documentaries with the fucking legend, Dave Grohl. (laughs) What's up now? Like, what are you up to? I had an opportunity to go and work alongside this, this guy named Grant Petty, who owns black magic design, this company that makes cameras and production and post-production software. And, you know, in my opinion, he's, he's the only person that gets like, is trying to solve the problem of with streaming services and all these new ways of watching things. As everybody knows, we just need like we need more stuff to put on these things. If you want to keep people engaged and paying a subscription every month, you know? Mm. Uh, so as a tech, like as technologists, if you will, on in, in this production and post-production industry, you know, we have to be getting ahead of it all, just like with the digital thing to film. It's like, you know, we need to scale the process back. There's been a lot of technology and a lot of advancements made since, you know, you know, I, I just, I tell people like, if you, if you put it in terms of something that you understand, like a phone, mm. think about the phone that you, you know, if you're my age, right. Mm-hmm. Which you are not, uh, <laughs> you know, the phone that I, you know, that, that was in my house when I was a kid is very different than the phone I use every day right now. Yes. Like it's a, t- it, it's not only a different device, but it, it conceptually, it's a totally different thing. Yeah, you're not staring at your home rotary phone for fucking four no. hours a day. And yeah. it does and it it does more than one thing. And also, if if you you know, if you could go back to when I was like, I don't know, even in you know junior high, you know, it's like video you know you're going to be able to look at each other and talk at the same time you know that was like a whole like yeah there's going to be flying cars too or cars that run on batteries too you know whatever it's like yeah not only did we get to be able to look at each other when we talk on the phone but i can also like get any answer to anything on the same device without having to talk to anyone like that's what i'm saying it's like for some people for some reason people's minds can grasp that concept tightly yeah but when you ask them to do something differently that they get paid to do, Mm. it's like the most frightening thing they've ever heard in their lives. Like (laughs) change disrupting my nine to five. Oh no. (laughs) Right. But I've been calling the same five people for the last 15 years to do the same exact job. Now I'm going to have to find new people that know how to do the job a new way. Yeah. Like, okay, (laughs) well, stop the presses. Yeah. And like you said before, you know, I, I feel like the, you know, Grant at Black Magic understands that there is a, an entire, you know, like multiple generations have passed since, you know, this whole industry has changed. Yeah. And nobody yet has embraced a new way to do anything. So yeah. he, here, here comes Grant to throw all these, you know, throw all these awesome ideas into the, you know, into the space. And I'm just out there, you know, basically trying to evangelize to people and let them know, like, there's not one way to do this anymore. Yeah. And it doesn't have to cost us, so, you know, so much money. You know, it's like the current day recording studio, I'm sitting in it right now. Like, Absolutely. I, so are you. Absolutely. Like, yeah. yeah, I can make a record right here, right now. If, if I was motivated and inspired enough to write songs. Dude, I was actually just telling this story the other day in the bedroom next to mine in the closet. An artist on a whim went in and recorded a song off of a beat that was made 
it five minutes before that, and that song that has uh-huh. 30 million streams on Spotify changed his life. Like, yeah, your bedroom is perfectly adequate. Yes. And that it took a few years to for the recording studios to all feel that and to realize like, oh, well, you know, maybe we turn this recording studio into a place where people can record a live piano and a live drum set, but they had to adapt to this new world. Mm-hmm. And the movie business and the TV, like the production sides of both of those things are headed in the exact same direction. Oh, no shit. Well, yeah. I mean, like once once you can viably make something with your telephone yeah. that will people will watch and make it'll make other people a lot of money, then the the whole, the, it's all been turned upside down. Yeah. Like, yeah. like the filmmakers of tomorrow are not going to go to Panavision and rent a $60,000 camera kit, you know, $60,000 a week camera kit yeah. to shoot their movie. They can That's go so buy, true. like you, you can go buy, you know, any one of many cameras, whether it's black magic or Sony or Canon or whatever, that'll give you effectively the same image yeah. for, you know, no, like no fraction. Money. Yeah. That's really, really interesting. I instantly think of Bo Burnham's inside and a 24's Florida project off of using uh-huh. like very minimal production, self-produced iPhones, DSLR cameras, mirrorless cameras, stuff like that. But yeah. I'm curious with Black Magic because everything you're saying, I'm like, oh, fuck, this is cool. Like, this is a really interesting mission statement because I'm familiar with Black Magic, but I'm realizing only to a certain level. Um, my roommate is a director and does a lot of music videos, and he had sold a Sony camera and bought a Black Magic, and he was all excited. I think it's Canon mounts, right? A lot of them will use an yeah, EF mount. Yeah. And he gets this camera. It's pretty small. And he's like, dude, like I think it was above 4k. I forget which one it was. 6k. Yeah. And I'm looking at it and I'm looking at the, the form, the size of it. And I'm like, no shit. And he's like showing it to me. I'm like, okay. So I kind of left it there and I was like, oh, black magic. Like it's like very cinema quality, portable, nice camera. And I like forever. I thought it was just that. And now, like right before we started this episode, I was looking yeah, yeah. at the website and I was like, oh, it's so much more than cameras. So hearing but, you mean, explain that, it, it, it's it's not so much just, hey, this is our product. These are our cameras. It's how are we going to innovate and how are we going to be a solution yeah. for the future of... Build an ecosystem, you know, basically. Well, first of all, Grant, who started the company, made... Uh, adapters and video signal pass-throughs and all kinds of different uh, devices used in 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 a lot of live TV and post production. That's how he started making these cool. things in his garage, like wow. taking his blender apart and using the pieces and stuff. Like that's the level of ingenuity that this human being has. And when he calls you and says, "Hey, do you want to come work for me?" You're kind of like, "Yes, I totally do." Yes, I do. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's like again it all comes from that mindset. So if Grant can make his own camera sensor and he can put it in a, a body of a camera that can shoot 12 K and sell it to you for $6,000, he's going to do that because then you can do what you want to do. Cause you have the tool in your hands. Again, like I, when I was in, junior high and I was starting to get into music really heavy and I wanted to get an electric guitar. It was a big deal because electric guitars were expensive. And, you know, I had to like, you know, really convince my parents, like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take it seriously. Yeah. And you got an electric guitar and it was a big deal. It was a big Nowadays, deal. Yeah, you walk into Guitar Center for like $180, you can walk out with an amp and a guitar. It might not be the nicest thing ever, but it was a hell of a lot nicer than what I could afford at the time. Point being, like, the tools are in your hand now. So now you can make the magic. And that's what this, that's what all of this shit should be about. Like, every filmmaker that everybody loves and thinks is amazing and is still watching, you know, characters that they created i'm thinking like george lucas especially george lucas built all that self that shit himself like nobody had that all that stuff for special effects you know all those all those tools and and you know all that machinery because that's what you know it was a lot of analog you know moving parts nuts and bolts you know like all that stuff and all those concepts 
you know, came from those guys' brains, not from companies making that tech. What you're saying that's, is uh, reminding me of something that I'm, I've very adamantly stood behind and been excited for is like, I feel like there was a time where you could be a very, very talented creator in any field, but the, there was like a, there was a financial barrier to entry that said, if you don't have this gear, no one's going to care right. or whatever. And I think that that's being disrupted so heavily that Best. now stories and compelling whatever it is, if it's film, if it's music, if it's conversation, if it's comedy, anything that's taken away. And these gatekeepers can't say, oh, well, it's not on this platform. You're just like anything that's good can be found. No, I mean, I love that. The I mean, eventually. You know, it's like. For a studio as big as Disney to survive. Everyone has to be into Star Wars and Marvel forever. <laughs> like that's all those eggs are in that basket. You know, like it's like no one's ever going to not love Star Wars and Marvel. That's, you know, that's like the thing. And, and Pixar too, I guess. And, you know, like all the princess crap. But my point is, is that it's all very specific things. And as you know, and I know, people's taste changes overnight. Yeah. Like it could all of a sudden be that nobody gives a shit about Spider-Man anymore. Like, you know, in two months. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, totally, exactly. Like the example, the picture you're painting. Yes. Yeah. So my, my point is to, to what you're saying is eventually stories, all there's going to be left. You know, yeah. like that's the only thing that's going to be left. Like eventually this whole, like, obsession with nostalgia will go away yeah you know and i think it's going to be this next generation that's coming because they don't know like my kid doesn't know like half the shit that matters to me doesn't matter to her right you know and that's how it, it's gonna finally go like you know our generation you know not to be a dick but like we you know like some of the last the last major you know, cultural and art movements have, you know, happened because of the generation I was in, you know, like all the music in the nineties, right? Like all that stuff, you know, that whole irony thing and then becoming obsessed with, you know, retro and nostalgia that happened. Like when, you know, like during, how old are you? I'm 30. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're, you're very young, but like for <sighs> me, you so like, much. You're welcome. But like for me, I'll take me to 30. Um, but you know what I'm saying? Like we did that. We we started all these things in our, you know, in, during our time as younger people that are still lingering now. But by the time my kid gets to be in high school, like she's not going to get the ironic joke of like why something is funny and isn't funny. You know, like I I, have, I don't know how to explain this, but like we've been so reliant on making fun of things and, you know, like outwardly judging things. And, you know, like as a, as a culture, like deciding that like, there was no merit to this, this was garbage. And that's why this happened that like, it's, it's so counterproductive when it comes to creating new stuff and making, you know, new things happen. Like, in other words, you can, you know, you can take a shit all over those 80s, you know, like hair bands and the, you know, I say hair bands, but like, you know, all those bands from the 80s that, that made, you know, that basically made MTV, right? Like the Poisons and the Bon Jovis and all those bands are the reason MTV existed. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you can, you can make fun of it and you can like, you know, you can like, you know, laugh at it or whatever but you know seeing the merit in it is what's going to inspire you to do something new and creative yeah laughing at it but then being okay with making the same marvel movie over and over and over again doesn't make you an artist yeah well i just i think i think that's cool like hearing you explain what black magic is and what you're doing oh and like, sorry I, yeah i forgot that we were talking about that yeah <laughs> no but, I, but yeah to my point the reason why i work you know, for Grant is that I, I think he's, you know, he's one of the last people that's looking at it. Like, I mean, he's probably the, 
the person on earth that is looking at that the most. Mm -hmm. And I find that to be very inspiring. I think that that's really cool that after everything that you have accomplished in all of the different facets of your life, that you're still embracing the future of and looking where people are disrupting things. Like that spirit seems to have stayed in you for ever since the beginning. Yeah, you have to. It's fucking cool. You can't. It's fucking cool. You can't ever think that something is going to stay the same because it's not. There's always going to be a a large group of people that aren't satisfied and yeah. aren't happy with what's happening right. I mean, you see it every day politically, you see it artistically, you see it, you know, yeah. and you know, we might agree with some of it, we might disagree with some of it, you know, when it comes to art or politics or money or what's important in life, but the bottom line is I don't care who you are, you want to be inspired. Yeah. Like that's the bottom line. You want to you want to feel included. And you want to be inspired. And those two things are what I think everyone should focus on is being inclusive and inspiring people. Like those are the only two things that matter. Like, you know, because then you feel good. I don't know. What the fuck? Yeah. And like, dude, it's just like, here you are. Like you've, you've applied that clearly in all sorts of different chapters of your life and career. And you're still here saying exactly that. And I, I just... I find that really interesting and cool and inspiring. The message has never changed. You know, like my message has never changed. You know, Emily in, you know, in my band, you know, Emily and I had very similar tastes in music. Emily played guitar. And, you know, although Emily's very talented and I'm not, you know, don't take this as something as me being dismissive of anything. But, you know, for a young woman in Indiana where she grew up, it wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't like all these people were, you know, clamoring to be in a guitar, like a, like a metal or a hard rock yeah, band no. with a woman guitar player. And I met her in school and I saw this interest and I saw her love for the thing. And I, and I saw that in her, you know, like I saw like, oh, you love this. Like I love it. Mm-hmm. So we should probably do this together. Yeah. And it was a big motivating factor for me. Like I, you know, I, wanted to be in a band with Emily because I wanted her, I wanted to see her succeed and I wanted her to be able to live her dream too. Because like, you know, as a fucking, you know, suburban white kid, man, a boy, I was always a lot, you know, Oh, I want to be in a band. No problem. Go be in a band. You know, no one's going to look at that and think something of it or judge me ahead of time. It's true. We're just going to be like, go dude. Yeah. It's true. But like, it's going to be, it's going to take a lot to break my spirit and make me not want to be this way. You know? I think that's like, awesome, dude. We got to move through it. Like we got to, you got to just do awesome shit. Like, you know, that's all I want my kid to learn. Like just get up today and do some awesome shit. Like why I, not? Everybody's so worried about, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people in this country are so worried about their freedoms, you know, right now. Yeah. And I, and I always say to friends, certain friends of mine, like, what freedoms are you giving up? The freedom to go do do awesome shit? You give that every day up every day when you go to your job that you hate. Holy shit, dude. <laughs> There's your freedom. What are you going to do with all that shit. freedom? Oh, that just got me so good. <laughs> I don't understand. Like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. And uh, the freedom that- is that you could be anything you want to be here, mm-hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Some people it's going to be a little harder. Some people it's going to be a little easier, but it can happen. And that's, you know, every day that you go into a job that you hate or that you're just working so that you can be finished with it. That's that's no way to live. There's so much awesome shit to do. Like, you know, people will tell me all I've ever wanted to do is write. I'm like, well, fucking go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. What you have a computer and a brain? Like, yeah. What are you doing, dude? It took me like very, very recently. I, it was finally walking away from a job that I was very unhappy with Good. to go all in on podcasting because I'm like, this is my favorite thing in the world, and like, yeah, the stability now is much less. I'm like, I don't know how certain pieces are going to come together, but I'm so fucking happy. So yeah. I can, and it as, will come together. Like if you keep doing it. And you're good at it. Mm. You know, if you just put all the effort into being great at it, then it'll all work out. Yeah. That's like, I don't, awesome. 
I will never hear anything from anyone differently. Like there's never going to be a, a lesson I will hear from a teacher or another parent or anything. Like, it's like, if you just dedicate yourself to something and give a shit, and if you love it, like if you really, you know, at the end of every project we do, you know, and it's the same with every record I've ever made. All I want to be able to do is say, that's the best fucking thing I could do right then. That's the best thing that could have come out of me you know, right then. And if I watch it in 10 years, I'm not going to be embarrassed by it. Now at this stage in my life, you know, having had gone through some pretty heavy health shit and, you know, I've had friends die from all the things that die from, from the things, you know, like cancer and heart mm-hmm. disease and all these things that, you know, all kill all people eventually. But, you know, I, I was talking about this with somebody the other day, you know, I'm, for, for my friends that have passed on that are musicians or artists or filmmakers, like the people that have, you know, made records and things, it's like, I can, I can put on what they've made and I can be with them again. Like I can be with them all over again when it came out or when they told me about doing, they were going to do it, you know, Hey, I got this. I fucking wrote this song about something this last night going to be on our new record, blah, blah, blah. You know, I put that song on and I'm sitting there with all of a sudden I'm sitting there with my friend Jim again. And, you know, not me, but my actual friend Jim who passed, you know, and I'm there, you know, I'm there with him listening to him. Tell me the thing about the story about coming up with the song and recording it and why, you know what I mean? It's yeah. hard to explain. Like, it's kind of like people with children, you know, like you, like I'll say like the normal people of the world, you know, it's like you have children because it's your legacy, right? You want to leave something behind that people will discover and will it will make people happy and make them feel satisfied. And that's why I'm so lucky to have been able to make records and movies and things because it's like, you know, I don't know, 25 years from now or 10 years after I'm dead, some kid, you know, flips on whatever, however you listen to music at that point. And they hear one of our records and they're like, God, this, you know, shit. This rips. You know, like this song. What'd you say? I said, this rips. Yeah. And you're like, this song is making me so stoked. I'm going to go out today and invent the, you know, the thing that turns, you know, water into electricity. I don't know, whatever. You know, it's like just as long as somebody gets inspired by it, then that's my job. Like I did my job then. Dude. Fuck it. That was so well said. And dude, just. Jim wrote a go do awesome shit. I mean, <laughs> what the fuck else is there to do? I love like, it. I love it. And it's like, I, it actually, it hits harder to me hearing it from you now having some years on me because it's, it's, it's more inspiration to be like, he's still doing it. What's my excuse? Yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, man, like I know tons of people old, way older than me. You know, look at Dave just as an example. Does he have to keep doing shit? I mean, you know, the average person would always, you know, would say stuff like, uh, you know, why does he do so much stuff? Doesn't he have enough money? And you're like, you so don't fucking get this. Yep. Like the money will come like the money will fucking happen. But (laughs) the magic can't you can't always do the magic. Like eventually you're going to be too fucking old. Or you're going to be too tied up with other things or, you know, whatever it is, or you're going to get sick. And then what fucking, you know, like, ah, just uh, again, like that makes me crazy about any, you know, any person that I ever, you know, read about that, that, that has like a, you know, a long career, you know, like you look at like a Reese Witherspoon or you look at like, uh, you know, any of these actors or sports people that have like production companies and make documentaries and do this or do that. And, and people always say like, it's just, it seems so weird to me that those people do all that stuff, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like when is enough enough? You're like, it's not about the money. That's like, purpose. It has nothing to do with the money. Yeah. You know, the last project we did with Dave, he, the best part of this last project that we, we did during the pandemic, which, you know, people will know about, you know, soon enough. It's like he pulled me aside one day and, and he was like, isn't it fucking awesome that we get to do this all together? And I was like, yes. And that's why I'm just like, yeah. Yeah, it is. Why does it have to be any more fucking complicated than that? 
Dude, it doesn't. Because it doesn't. And if you make everyone feel included, yeah. including the woman who's telling you where to park your car every morning when you pull up to set. If everybody feels included, they go home that night and they're like, fuck yeah, that was awesome. And what else? Dude, <sighs> I don't know. That it's, was so you know, good. That was in so the current good. state of the world with somebody who thinks the way I do, it's not, it's not always easy to get up and feel that way anymore. But man, you gotta, you just gotta do it. You gotta remember Everybody just deserves to be happy and feel satisfied. Like everybody, you know, it's a, we're all in the same boat. We're all getting our ass kicked by the same monsters. Yeah. Well, dude, I, I, I really loved this and I had no idea what to expect. I think both of us kind of wanted to go into this of just like trusting yeah, yeah, Joe. And uh, this was a really, Joe, really listen, insightful I got, conversation. I, I haven't even gotten into the Joe DeSanto part of my life. That's a whole other... <laughs> That's like four more Yeah, episodes. we'll have to come back to those. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this episode. It was a pleasure. Where can everybody find you if they want to keep up with the band or see what you're I, see what yeah, awesome shit you're up to? Yeah, you know, we're we're on all the social media stuff. And I don't even know if I said, but our band's called Fireball Ministry. Yep. So we're on if you Google search that, you'll find everything. You know, Therapy Studios is, you know, who I work with, with almost all of my, you know, projects that are mine, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm out there. You know, I always tell people I couldn't, I couldn't get myself off the internet at this point if I tried. So he can be, I'm out there. Well, there it is. I'm happy, happy for that. Thank you so much, dude. Thank you. So there it is. Jim Rota's story. Thank you for listening. If you're here at the end, I really do hope you liked it. If there's anything you didn't like, shoot me a message. Let me know what I can improve. I always want to make this podcast the best it possibly can be. And if you did like it, there's a couple of very simple things that you can do that help massively. The main one is just sharing it on social media, sharing it with your friends. If you're down to take a second right now here at the end and just post this on social media or text it to a friend, whatever it is, sharing this helps so much. If you want to go above and beyond, there's a Patreon with a ton of behind the scenes content, bonus episodes, all sorts of stuff. I try to make that really special. That's patreon.com slash where are all my friends think that just about says it. Thank you as always for listening. Let me know the guests you want to hear from and I'll be back next week with another episode.